Dobry utra, and I'm afraid that's all I can say in Russian today. Um, it's a great honor to be here. I would like, before I say anything else, everybody in this room loves wine and is interested in wine. Please think for a moment about our friends in California, the disaster of the fires has been really bad, and um, there are, I think, 1,500 houses that have been destroyed. Uh, people have been killed. We, we don't know about the vines and the vineyards. So it's a very, it's a big disaster, and I'm sending my personal um, feelings for those people, and I'm sure we all are. Um, I can't resist showing this. I hope you all know the wine in the middle or some of the other wines. I would like to say thank you to Simple and thank you to all of you who have introduced my little sheep or my big sheep to your bear and to a large number of Russian consumers. Um, to, we, we sell about two million bottles of wine every year, thank you. Um, and until recently, America was absolutely our number one country. We are in 40 different countries. Um, but we have since the last 18 months, really, um, in Russia, it has gone, shh, we have a flying sheep. We have a rocket sheep. And if we continue like this, Russia will be our second biggest country. I think it almost is already. And it's extraordinary. So it's very, it's a big pleasure for me to be here. I'm not here to talk about my wine today. I'm here to talk about other things. This is the book that um, I have, I'm finishing writing and will be uh, in, um, it will be sold in February next year. And I hope it will be translated into Russian. But the future of wine is not what it was. I am saying that everything is changing in all of our lives so quickly. We cannot imagine that wine will carry on the same just because it has in the past. Not very long ago, we saw the launch of this toy for $1,000. So what can this toy do? This is a film I took in China a, a year ago. This man has just bought that bottle of wine in 36 seconds. 36 seconds, and he checked the rating. Now, this is in America. Uh-oh. Okay, well, I forgot about that one. But that's okay, because the bot actually can learn. It knows your habits, it knows who your friends are, knows what they like, because it watches their social feeds. So, your phone now is going to run your life. It's beginning to run your life, but it is going to run your life much more. And that will affect wine as much as everything else. But also, these things I've just shown you are not to do with the iPhone uh, 8. They are just things that we're having in all phones. What I'm about to show you is also available in all phones from the iPhone 6S until now, and it will be available in other phones. But this is just where we are going. Augmented reality. 
So we're in an office. We have a, this is what you see when you're looking at your phone or your tablet. So they're all working, and then we have this door. But the door isn't really there. We can look, we can go behind the door. The door is floating. We can walk in a minute, we can go through the door. So we walk through the door, and now we are watching a football match with Porto versus Benfica in Portugal. And we can walk around in the stadium, and we can go back through the door. So that could be a vineyard. That could be a cellar. It could be anything. That is available now. So we are giving consumers the ability to visit our vineyards, to talk to us, to do all sorts of things. And this is just the beginning. Does anybody know how many iPhone developers there are? That's people who do not work for Apple. They are independent people developing software for Apple. Does anybody guess? 13 million, one at three million around the world. And they're all working on things. So when you have your iPhone next week, the week after, the month after, you have got all of those people coming up with ideas. And this is very, very important. I don't know if any of you have shares in Apple, but Apple need to make the next one even better. So anything that we have today on iPhone 8 or the System 10, it has to be even better in the next time. So this is where we are going. So I'm now going to show you something. I'm going to go back. I'm going to talk briefly about my vision of the wine world. This is before I talk about the future. It's my way of seeing how, how people uh, look at wine. And Evgeny earlier said, why do people spend money on wine? So, this is food. I think you can understand that's food. On the left is a sandwich. On the right is a souffle. I think everybody in this room understands that the thing on the left you eat with your hands. It's very simple. You buy it standing up. You usually eat it standing up. The thing on the right, in my experience, is not great to eat with your hands. It's messy. So you use a spoon. And usually you have the thing on the right in the kind of restaurant that the sommeliers in this room work in. We can see the difference between these two things. The thing on the left is usually cheaper than the thing on the right. So in wine, we put the cheapest wine and the most expensive wine in the same shape bottle and we expect the consumer to understand that the sandwich wine on the left is different to the souffle wine on the right. And we very cleverly come up with chateau names and all sorts of fancy things to put on the $10 bottle to make it look more like the $100 bottle. And the $100 bottle we make as simple as possible because we're arrogant wine producers and we think it is the job of the consumer to understand the difference. And if you're in a restaurant, maybe the price or maybe the sommelier will help you. Maybe in a shop, uh, the, you can see it, but the consumer is confused. The one piece of data that we have across the whole world is that most people are frightened of wine. Even very wealthy people are very often frightened of wine. And our answer is to say they need education. People need to go to school. And I have an answer to this. I'm going to open a school to teach people about shoes. I'm going to teach women about shoes because women obviously have a big problem buying shoes. There are so many different shoes so many different colors, so many different prices. How can a woman buy a shoe without going to school to understand about shoes and about leather and about how they're made and about the different countries? Oh, but the shoe companies are making a lot of money. Maybe it's because women and men go into a shoe shop, they find the shoes they like, 
and they buy the shoes they like. And that works for whiskey, and it works for vodka, and it works for gin. People buy what they like. Some people become passionate about whiskey. Some people become passionate about shoes. Most people find what they like and go on buying it. And the wine industry is moving in that direction, has always been in that direction, but most of us, and me as I was as a wine writer, fail to understand that. So now I'm going to give you a little bit of a translation here. Now in food, we have haute cuisine, that's the souffle, we have the sandwiches, we have health food, uh, all the food that, that I don't necessarily like eating, but it's going to make me healthier. We have fast food, that's the other things, not just the sandwich. And we have chocolate, which I just put there because I like chocolate. So wine, we have terroir. How many consumers understand the word terroir? We have grababa, lelugo, eye drip, fad drip, and q drip. How many of you understand those words? There's a good reason why you don't understand those words. It's because I invented them. But remember, those words are no more strange to you than terroir is to the consumer. So terroir is the easy one. Neil Martin, who's a good friend and somebody I have huge respect, will be talking to you this afternoon, and everything that Neil will talk about is about terroir. It's about the soil, the vintage, the appellation, the points, the quality. Everything that we have all gone to school and learned about for wine. To understand that a Beaujolais village is better than a Beaujolais, and a Saint-Emilion Grand Cru is better than a saint No, no, it isn't always, is it? That's confusing. Ah, but a Saint-Emilion Grand Cru classé, uh, and, and Pomerol doesn't have any Grand Cru. Oh, all that stuff, okay? Now, I'm going to talk about Grababa. What is Grababa? It is a grape-based beverage that's alcoholic. So, basically, it's anything made from grapes that is alcoholic that people drink. So, people buy what they know. I've chosen their Gallo, it could be. It's what people do, I don't know if the next slide does it, here we are. A glass of red, what, what kind of red? Chardonnay, where from? Uh, Prosecco, um, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, no, anything. I, I don't want Sauvignon Blanc, any a white wine. But these people are not asking for the vintage. They don't know the region. They don't know about the barrels or not the barrels. I hate Chardonnay. Uh, what would you like to drink? Chablis. <laughs> don't you know that Chablis is made from Chardonnay? No. You're a very stupid person. Do you know the name of the Prime Minister of Canada? No. Then you're a stupid person. <laughs> Which is the more important in the world? So this is what I am saying most people in most places, including in some of your fine restaurants, actually are doing. They are frightened of wine and they buy the thing they know. The thing they know could be Merlot, cheap. It could be Chablis or Sancerre or Chateau Neuf du Pape. It's a name. Do you know the grapes Chateau Neuf du Pape are made from? No. Do you care? No. Do you like it? Yeah. Now I have Le Lugo. This is one that those of you who work in, in restaurants will know. Liquid luxury good. So I am buying this because it is a luxury. Last night, in a club in Moscow, or in a hundred clubs in Moscow and in London, a very wealthy Russian, maybe one who owns a football team in London, said, Crystal! I am very sorry, we have run out of Crystal. Krug. Okay. Are they the same? Do they taste the same? No. 
he is buying Krug or Cristal or Dom Perignon because they are all expensive and he knows the names. I can't have a Ferrari, so I will have the Maserati. It's not the Maserati is better or less. These people are actually buying these wines in the same way as other people are buying Prosecco. And I use the expression, bought like beer. I want a beer, I want a Merlot, I want Cristal. In each case, there is no soil, no vintage, no grapes, no Parker points. It's all to do with something I know in my head. And very important, for one person, Cristal is a luxury. For somebody else who doesn't have very much money, Prosecco is a luxury. Everybody has their own level of luxury. And by the way, Whispering Angel is a good example. Rosé has joined into the luxury market. For my, my wine, Le Grand Noir, if you know it, I call an affordable luxury. It's not very expensive, but it looks nice, it tastes nice. For the people who are buying it, it may be a luxury. Idrip is a much smaller category, but it's what I call, an, it's more complicated. I was explaining it to the translators earlier. It's issue-driven purchase. What it is, is it's a reason for buying the wine that is not because of the taste of the wine or even the quality of the wine. It's organic. It's made by people who are paid a good wage. It comes from a country that I like or it doesn't come from a country I don't like. So, um, go back. Uh, so, and maybe I don't like buying from big companies, so I only buy from families. But all of this is not because the wine is better. It may or may not be that you know the vintage and the soil, maybe. We now have Fadrip, fashion driven. That's very easy. Uh, it's trendy, it's the new thing. So um, now I don't drink uh, Pinot Grigio, I drink Fiano. Uh, I drink Gavi, except Gavi is maybe not so fashionable, but it's going down. So some fashions last and become mainstream, and other fashions go down. But fashion is there, and you, you know in your shops or your restaurants what is a new fashion. Picpoule de Pinay is a, is a white fashion at the moment. Um, I think Malbec has been a fashion, is now um, solid. Carmener, to me, I'm sorry, translators, Carmener. Um, Carmenere from Chile has never really become a fashion. It, was, it tried, and I think. So, and then lastly, we have curiosity driven. I've never had one of those, a Chinese wine, an Indian wine, or even a Russian wine, if you're not in Russia, or an English sparkling wine, if you are in Russia. The problem of being a curiosity-driven wine is that people who buy because of curiosity are curious. So the danger to me is that the person who bought, the person in Moscow who bought my English sparkling wine today, is he going to buy another English wine, sparkling wine tomorrow, or mine, or is he going to say, ah, Here's a sparkling wine from Peru or Uruguay. I'll try that. And the day after, he will try something else and something else. So it's, to me, the dangerous categories here are fashion and curiosity, because both of them, by definition, people will move on. There is a link between Qdrip and terroir. People who are interested in wine are likely, maybe, curious, but it's complicated because some of the terroir people only drink Burgundy, and they know every vineyard in Burgundy and every vintage and every producer, but they never drink Spanish wine or Italian wine, and so they certainly don't drink Russian or Chinese wine. On the other hand, some of the people who are curious about wine um, actually are, they know everything about all the wines in the world, they want to try new things. So those are the categories, and I would like later on, if you want to ask me, please ask questions, please, please. And this is an area that I'd like really to talk about. But the important thing is that in the volume sold, I am arguing that most of the wine that is sold is Grababa. 
The second category is terroir, and the others are all quite small. When we talk about that, that will change from different countries. So some countries have more terroir wines than others, but France is definitely like that. We look at, va sorry, we look at value, and the terroir value comes up because we tend to pay more money for terroir wines, and we tend to pay a bit more money for the Lugo. And then we talk about what we all talk about in the media, online, the magazines, and nobody talks about Grababa. You can't read an article. Nobody wants to write about Barefoot from Gallo or, um, uh, let's say, um, any of those sort of uh, wines that are, are, are generally available because unless the advertiser is paying, it doesn't normally appear. What we want to read about is somebody's orange wine or natural wine where he made 1,000 bottles in his garage. So back to my picture of the future of wine, which all of this is in the background, if you like. So wine growing. Let's see what we're going to talk about. There are translations on the screen. I'm going to go back and forth because I won't be able to read the Russian. So the issues of production. I'll give you time to read it quickly in Russian. If I can go back. Climate change, disease, labor, social responsibility, fashion, and efficiency. So. Go on to this in Russian, if you like. Um, climate change is going to be huge. We have seen the storms. We are already seeing the effect on um, alcohol in wines. I'll talk more about that. When I lived in Burgundy in the 1980s, people used to pick grapes with a natural alcohol level of 9%, sometimes less. And then they would add sugar legally, and then illegally to get the wine to uh, 12 and a half or 13. And if you have never added a bag of sugar to a fermenting vat of red wine, it's one of the most wonderful smells in the world. It's like the best jam factory that you ever go to. Um, but those wines today, those same vineyards are making wine with natural alcohol of 14%. That's not all climate change. There's viticulture, there's other things, but a lot of that is climate change. And if you look at the harvest date, in when I lived in Burgundy, we used to pick grapes in October. Now sometimes we pick grapes before the 1st of September. Go back. So we have heat, we have drought, and we have some varietals that aren't working anymore. We may have to move to new vineyards, we have a problem with water, a big problem with water. Every now and then in Australia and in California, it rains, so the problem of water goes away, but it doesn't go away completely. It's, it's there in the background. So we're going to have to find ways of irrigating more efficiently. We're going to have to find grapes that exist with less water. Um, the storms we can't deal with. But maybe some places, unless they're charging enough money, will not be able to go on making wine. When it comes to heat, the other thing that we will be doing is moving to higher vineyards. Now, to my own experience with our wines in Le Grand Noir, all of our wines are blends from different vineyards within 6,000 hectares of Languedoc Roussillon. Our lowest vineyards are 50 hectares. Uh, 50 meters. Our highest are three, uh, 320, actually. And already, I was in the vineyards um, a few weeks ago, we were doing some drone filming. Um, the difference we're seeing in the crispness, the freshness of the wines at the higher altitudes. And I am sure that in 20 years' time, <clears throat> we'll be using more higher altitude vineyards, which are being planted and the lower altitude vineyards will have, they will go into blends, but they will not be at the front. And that's a dramatic change. On the other hand, we are learning how to grow different grapes better. So we're growing Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir, which are cool climate grapes, 
in Longadoc efficiently. So it's not all it's not all a big problem. It's a challenge rather than a problem. So please come back to me with questions on this. Disease is another thing. Nothing to do with climate change. There's a lot of talk of disease. Um, the one that you will hear about quite a lot is trunk disease. It's in the it's actually in the vine. It comes from pruning problems, and you get a disease. The vines will lose productivity by as much as 20%, and eventually they die. And they, and they are infectious, so you can get a whole vineyard. There's a man called Richard Smart, who is the world expert, and you can read his writing on it. Um, he thinks it's a, it's a global problem. Some grapes have more of the problem than others. And for example, um, Sauvignon Blanc has a big problem. Um, those of you who like cognac, uh, Uni Blanc, which is not a very interesting grape, <laughs> it's good for cognac, has a big problem. So there's going to be a lot of talk about trunk disease. Pierce's disease is carried by um, an insect um, called the sharpshooter. Nice name. It's a very big problem in California. It hasn't spread internationally yet, but it could. And one of the things that we need to be aware of is that the entire world is relying, we think there are a lot of different grapes, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, da, 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 but they are all Vitis vinifera. Um, if you go back to Ireland, there was a plague, all the potatoes in Ireland uh, were wiped out. Uh, we had phylloxera in the same problem. We are at risk. So at the moment, most people do not like the idea of genetic modification. In Europe, it's illegal. Um, I think there is every likelihood that we are going to have to accept it as a solution. We have other things. We have leaf roll. We have pests. But I think... Sorry, I didn't give you this in Russian. Hello, I'm Sassi Nikodoy from East Globe's newsroom, and I'll present you our news from today. Decoding the genome of Cabernet Sauvignon will make it possible to accelerate the... So, that's it. That's all you need to see of that. That is where we're going. Labor. Donald Trump is not the best friend of the Californian wine industry. Um, however, him saying we don't want any more Mexicans is not actually the problem. The Mexicans do not want to work in the vineyards anymore. And actually, in France, the young French people do not want to work in the vineyards. I don't know how many of you have ever worked in a vineyard. It's hard work. And when you are buying wine, as we are today, for one euro a bottle, one euro a liter, 60 cents a liter, 50 cents a liter in bulk, human beings, how can human beings go and prune vines and do all the work? It's not logical. Either we need to raise the price of wine, or we need to find a solution. As this year's grape harvest nears its end, this novel vineyard helper could offer overworked winemakers a less stressful future. Wall Ye the robot can drive across vineyards, test the soil and prune vines after the summer harvest. Its inventor, Christoph Milo, has put his... So, uh, I was in a conference in the US last year. Um, these, that's a French invention, New Zealand is one of the places that is driving automation because they don't have any Mexicans. Um, Australia doesn't have any Mexicans. All of these new world countries are looking at ways of um, automating. In China, where I was at the beginning of this year, um, as in Russia, they traditionally have to bury vines under the soil in the winter. One third of the cost of wine growing in China you could sit over there, guys. There's chairs. <laughs> um, one third of the cost of, of production is burying and taking the earth off. The Chinese, who are not stupid, are inventing machines to take off the earth and put the earth on. It is estimated that in five years' time, it will be possible to have a vineyard with no human beings at all. And one of the reasons we can do that is we will have drones flying over, which will tell us what needs doing and where. So, um, 
So we will be, in terms, we're now moving on to social responsibility. This is something that we're seeing more and more. I don't think Donald Trump has understood any of these words. Certainly not the word responsibility. Um, but uh, we are moving into that era. Um, certainly in our winery, we are trying to make our wine sustainably, and there is the beginnings of a market for organic. Um, it's taken a long time, but I think it's coming. And if we are having robots in the vineyards, um, we will also be looking at what products we use. And it will not, the, the best uh, image for this is don't look at France or Spain or Italy, look at uh, New Zealand, which is 99% sustainable. Look at uh, Chile, which has also gone very sustainable. These new world countries with easy climates are the first to say, we reuse our vineyard, our winery water. Uh, we don't use the chemicals as much as we did. We still use some, but we use less every year. And the idea is to move more and more towards um, uh, organic um, production. And one reason for this is that the treatments we have been using don't work as well as they did. If you put too much of the treatment, the bugs get stronger. So everybody I know who has a, an organic vineyard says their vines are healthier. Biodynamic? I don't know. I think that everybody I know in the biodynamic world, they've all joined a religion. And the religion says you have to go to the church on a Sunday, not a Monday. And you have to do this, you have to do that. I think we are going to see a move towards variants of biodynamics. And my hero in this is Angelo Gaia, who never does the same as anybody else. Everybody else has a website. He doesn't have a website. So and so he says, I like some of the ideas of biodynamics, but maybe the cow horn I don't need. So. So here we have our drones. I spent a day in our vineyards with a, a flying planes over, flying a drone. These will become more and more simple and we will be able to see where the problems are. We will see where there is disease. We will see where we need water. Um, the, the, the knowledge of our vineyards is growing all the time. We're putting soil sensors in everywhere which will show you exactly what is needed. So instead of putting a lot of product everywhere, we will treat the individuals. And as I said, robots of various kinds. So in winemaking, most of what I've said there is the vineyard. Now we'll talk about winemaking, alcohol, health, styles, and cost. So. How do we reduce the strength of wine, the alcoholic strength? We can pick earlier. In Australia, they have demonstrated with some of the very, very good modern Chardonnays coming out of Australia with 12.5% that taste good. My Burgundy is 13.5% and my Australian, and it's warmer in Australia, at 125 So there is some uh, clever viticulture. But also, it's, it, when the, it gets really hot, and when we have 14.5% um, Grand Cru Bordeaux, um, we are going to have to start thinking. And it is going to be uh, work, yes, in viticulture, but also in the vines themselves. Either we are going to have to use different varieties, or we're going to come back to genetic modification of some kind. Um, but yeasts are going to be interesting. Already, in the world of natural wine, we all want to use wild yeasts because wild yeasts represent the terroir. Uh, it's interesting, if you look into that, that's a big question because the Portuguese company, Sograp, analyzed all of the wild yeasts on the skins of the grapes in one vineyard in one year and they analyzed them again the next year. They're all different except for, I think, six maybe 13, but basically every year you get different yeasts. So does one vineyard have its own yeasts? It's not certain. Um, but wine made from wild yeasts are certainly taste different to wines made from one 
um, industrial cultured yeast. I think a lot of work is going to be done on how we ferment the grapes. This time I'll try and do the Russian earlier rather than... <laughs> okay, so health. We have issues of um, people with headaches and hangovers and so on. Again, the natural wine lobby tends to say SO2. Uh, no sulfur dioxide, no hangover or no headache. It's a big question. Um, actually, some people are sensitive to sulfur dioxide. They have a problem, but they also have a problem with vegetables in all sorts of other things. Um, there are the, one of the biggest problems in wine is histamine. And histamine levels vary from one grape variety to another. And I think there's going to be a lot of work done into how do we find red wines that do not give people headaches. And not everybody, it's, it's some people are unlucky and they suddenly start to get headaches from red wine, but not white wine. Uh, and they get headaches from one kind of red wine, not other kinds. That is something that we're going to study and we're going to understand a lot more of. And again, maybe yeasts will be another issue. So winemaking styles. Again, the natural, uh, the people who are into the natural side hate the concept of thermovinification, of very industrial winemaking. It works. If you want to make a soft, rich red wine, um, that thermovinification is a good way to do it. If you want to make a wine that has the flavor of the terroir, of the soil, and so on, thermovinification is not the answer. We have to decide who we are making our wine for. If we are making grababa, thermovinification, good. If we're trying to make a Grand Cru Burgundy, no. Um, oak. I've just been writing about oak uh, for Meininger's Wine Business International. Um, if I asked you, do we use more oak today or less oak today? How many people think we're using more today? Hands up. How many people think we're using less today? You're all wrong, I'm afraid. The sales of barrels go up every year, but not just the sales of barrels, the sales of the staves, of the cubes, of the chips, of the powder, of the liquid, they're all going up. There are companies whose only job is to make products to make wine oaky. Seguin Moreau, the great barrel company, bought a Californian company called Stave-In three, four years ago. All Stave-In does is to make these products. If you have nothing better to do, visit the Seguin Moreau website and you will see the range of products Seguin Moreau has just to give oak character and qualities associated with oak to wine. So there will be more. And where do we see a lot of the taste for oak? I see it in Eastern Europe, to be honest, but I also see it in China. And I have seen recently an email from a Chinese buyer to, um, their, uh, to a supplier in Australia in which they were saying, um, I like the sample, but it needs to taste more premium. Please, could we have uh, more oak flavor, vanilla flavor, coconut flavor? And when they say flavor, they mean liquid flavor. By the way, if you didn't know this, it's called, sorry, I do this in, um, it's called uh, adding tannin. When you're adding the powder or the, the liquid, which are illegal in many countries, uh, if it's added as liquid tannin or powdered tannin, it's less illegal or it's easier to do or whatever. So. I've mentioned the yeasts, obviously, because we can get more flavors with our yeasts as well. You'll understand that I think the yeasts are quite interesting. Um, blending, this is something that I think that we're not talking enough about. It's very new. How many of you like orange wine, amber wine, skin contact wine, hands up? Quevery wine, if you like. How many do, you not, do not like it? Okay. I don't know what I think. I like, I'm working in Georgia. I like some examples. I don't like a lot of other examples. However, 
And a lot of my sommelier friends tell me how wonderfully these wines go with food. And it's true. Actually, Jerez, Fino, is very good with food. Most people don't drink Fino with food, but I like it with food. Do I drink Fino every day? No. Do I want to drink orange wine every day? No. However, there are some very clever people now who are making blends of 80% conventional, 20% skin contact. And we can even now imagine a blend, not imagine, a blend of stainless steel, oak, and skin contact in concrete. And we just make the right blend. Why not? Cocktails, I'll talk more about that in a minute, but these are wine-based products with fruit flavor. And then non-alcoholic wine is going to grow. So this in America is stuff that you, you don't see necessarily in Russia, except that in Russia you have a history of drinking sweet red wine, also in other parts of Eastern Europe, which in Britain and in France we don't. In America, these wines, uh, Apothic comes from Gallo in the middle, it's a huge brand, um, have between 10 and 15 grams of sugar per liter. And they are very, very popular. And they are growing and they are not cheap. We're talking 10 to $15 a bottle. This is an area where people uh, enjoy the wine. They are usually oaky. They are reasonably powerful in alcohol, not too powerful, but 13 and a half, 14, and with sugar and a lot of fruit. Is it wine? It's not a traditional Bordeaux, certainly. Is it made from grapes? Yes. Do people like it? Yes. One of the things about all of these wines, and sugar is very valuable in one respect, it softens tannin. And if your wines are not, grape, uh, not um, ripe, it also softens greenness. It makes it an easy drink. Remember that most consumers start with beverages with Coca-Cola, with fruit juice, with sweetness. And when you drink a gin and tonic, it has sweetness. Most beverages are sweet. Wine and beer are the exceptions to that rule. And generally, you have to get the taste for them. So here you are. This is proof. This is recent statistics. So the fastest growing category in America is Cabernet Sauvignon. The second highest, uh, fastest growing is red blends. So how do we deal with costs? Well, Get back. I don't think I've got that in Russian, I'm afraid. I'll go back. Automation. We use robots. We use everything we can. Uh, to make our cheap wine, we use concentrate. Uh, we have a product in the UK called British Made Wine, which was an invention in Britain, where we, drink, we, we buy concentrate from different countries. It sits in a tank. When we want to make wine, we add water and we add yeast. It's not wine, <laughs> it, it's not great, <laughs> but it's cheap. And then we add some other flavors, we can do things, and we can make cheap wine-based beverage. It already exists, nobody wants to talk about it, it's there. There will be more of it. Blending between countries and blending between regions. Most of us think that the most perfect wine comes from one vineyard or tiny little vineyard. Yes, for the terroir. For Grababa, if I could blend a wine from Moldova with a wine from Spain to make a good, cheap wine, where's the problem for the consumer? The consumer is not looking at the label to know where it came from. We have a, I don't have a slide, but there is a wine that you may have seen called Heart, with a heart on the label. It's called I Heart. Um, it's, it was, uh, my friends launched it, so I know it quite well. If you buy I Heart Pinot Grigio in the UK, it comes from Hungary. If you buy I Heart Pinot Grigio in Australia, it comes from Australia. The consumer doesn't care. He's buying Pinot Grigio. And as I said, oak products, we can say. So. I'm deliberately overlapping as we go along, so you'll see some of the same things coming up, and then I'm hoping you can ask me some questions. We're reasonably on time, I think. So go back. So industrial, 
the same things we've seen. That's what I'm calling my grababa. Fine wines. I haven't talked about these very much. There's good reason. You have Neil Martin. You have other people. I'm, I want to talk about other things. But when we talk about fine wines, how many of them are fine? When you buy a bottle of Chateau Neuf du Pape, or a bottle of Barolo, or a bottle of Saint-Emilion Grand Cru, if you do not know the name of the producer, are you sure it's going to be good? Of course not. Um, so I think we're going to see more quality control on those appellations, or those appellations will lose um, strength. What will gain strength is the brand. So I buy Chateau Neuf du Pape from this domain, not that domain. Um, the producers, maybe there'll be a group of producers, or there will be some form of other system, because the existing system does not work as well as it did. So, luxury. Again, something that in the wine world we really don't like to talk about. Jancis Robinson hates the word luxury wine. I think Neil Martin won't like it either because luxury wine is not fine wine. Sometimes they're the same, but they're not. The same. A luxury wine is something that is designed to be bought, as I said earlier, Lilugo, because it makes me feel good and you feel good when I give it to you. If I buy a Grand Cru Burgundy from a great producer and I give it to my friend who doesn't know anything about wine, he doesn't know how much I, I paid 100 euros for it. He doesn't know I didn't spend 20 euros. What's the point? Um, I, I love champagne. I buy grower champagne. When I go to my friend's house with a champagne from a good grower, he says, thank you. When I go to my friend's house with a bottle of Verve Clico in the box, he goes, thank you. <laughs> I'm very happy to give him the Verve Clico and keep the grower champagne. <laughs> so. I think we're going to see more luxury packaging. Sorry, I'll just give this to you in Russian. More celebrity association, more links to other luxury products, more lifestyle promotions that we, we associate this with events, and targeted marketing. This is something that I haven't talked about very much. We are going to see more and more and more selling to the right people, the people we know want to buy what we're selling. Natural wines, they will still exist, but there has to be a system to accredit uh, that, that she says what a natural wine is. Bespoke, we're now looking at can we tell from your genes what kind of wine you will like? Um, this is something that's a business in, um, so we got this? No, we haven't got the slide for that. There's a business in California um, that actually is saying, you know, for you, you should drink this, you should drink that. It's the beginning, but we're seeing it with food. And maybe for headaches and hangovers and other things, it's interesting. But we're also seeing made-to-measure wine where people can blend their own wine Actually, goes on for a while, but basically, you can decide the style of wine you want. You blend your own wine. I don't have to be taught to like Chateau Neuf du Pape or something else. I can make the wine that I want to drink. And then we're seeing it with perfume, we're seeing it with other products. I've talked a little bit about alcohol, so we won't need to talk about that. Sweet, we are going to see more sweet wine. And those of us who think that it's um, not uh, sophisticated, tough. Rosé, including sweet rosé, sh shooting up. And sommeliers, which food does rosé go with? Everything! You just drink it. That's one of the reasons people like it. Grababa. Cocktails, wine plus fruit. 
huge, huge growth in sales in the UK and in uh, France, um, but also we're seeing in other countries. It's a drink. Does it taste like wine? No. Is it made from grapes? Yeah, kind of. And this, you can't really see it, is a wine from Mondavi aged in bourbon, American whiskey barrels. Does it taste like wine? Well, it tastes like whiskey and wine. Is that a blend that I'm used to drinking? No. Do people like it? Apparently. <laughs> I'm doing a survey at the moment for the book, and uh, in America, there is a lot of the wine industry see cannabis as a major threat to the, it's either going to be a threat or something they can work with, but it's a threat. Packaging. So you can see those. So glass bottles. Can anybody tell me why every wine has to be in the same size and shape bottle? There's five shapes, four or five shapes of bottle. They're all 75 centiliters. Why? Because three, 400 years ago, when a glass blower in France was making bottles, <laughs> that's his lung, between 60 and 80, roughly. So we have 75. But so we have wine with 8% alcohol and wine with 15% alcohol in the same size bottle. There is no logic. A, a whole 75 centiliters of Amarone or of uh, Sauternes is too much. But actually, Moscato, maybe a liter and a half would be. So um, I think we're going to see that. Secondly, cheap wine is in too heavy bottles. We should make them lighter. And maybe we should have refundable bottles, refill them. Um, we can have smaller formats, we can have bigger formats, but the expensive wines will still be in heavy bottles. And I'm sorry, Jancis Robinson, Tim Atkin, they hate them, but we still buy chocolates in boxes, we still buy flowers in wrapping. So, and the, will, the bottles will be proprietary, molded with... And as I said, gift packaging, this is in China, Everything is in a gift pack, and that is Le Grand Noir in its gift pack. If you want it for Russia, we can do that. <laughs> so, PET. At the moment, we've done some wine in PET in uh, France. The problem is that it gets in the sea, it's bad if we don't recycle it. If we recycle it, it's wonderful, but not enough people do. However, the second word, biodegradable, is coming. Coca-Cola is the first, and there's also uh, Heineken, we will have biodegradable plastic bottles. They will change everything, because then our cheap wine can come in a container that we just throw away. Bag in box, it's big. That is Grababa. 50% of all wine in Sweden is in bag in box. Roughly the same in Australia. But those boxes we can develop, we can make them more luxurious, we can make them bigger, we can do other things. Tetra, cans, and kegs. I've seen in one of your, in your steak restaurant um, here in Moscow, I think, um, wine draft. We don't need to put wine in bottles. Wine was not in bottles historically. When you went to a bar, a, a restaurant in France 100 years ago, the wine came from the barrel. So putting it in a bottle is strange. Closures, I thought we were moving very fast towards screw caps, um, corks. We now have zero TCA corks. We don't yet have zero oxidation corks. We will have, they will be expensive. Um, synthetic, those synthetic corks are biodegradable. They will become more popular for that reason. And screw caps, we will see smarter screw caps. There are, in Australia, they're working on a glass-on-glass -glass closure, which is interesting, but the Vinolock glass closure is already attractive. It's too expensive. But I think there will be another way to close a bottle. I think that in the next few years, we have walked on the moon. We have to do something better than we've got at the moment. Communication. So, there will be fewer critics, and the critics will be stronger, but very few critics more 
peer reviews, Vivino, Amazon, where something has got five stars, like we have for restaurants and hotels, everything else, and social media. The voice will go around. Advertising will have to be more clever. There will be more restrictions already in Russia, you know that, but this will be global, but there will be more invention. We will see more clever ways of doing it. Product placement. I saw a movie on the plane coming over here in which it was very clear that a bottle of Barefoot was paid to be in the movie, and there will be more links with other products. I know people who are linking their wine with Porsche, car, Porsche cars, with other things. And the paid content, as I said, that's the product placement in a way. Oh, paid, sorry, paid content is not. The, the journalism we will see will be more and more paid for. Any journalists in the room who write for the public probably know how difficult it is to earn a living doing that. It will be easier to be paid by the wine producer to write a piece about them. That's going to, we're seeing more of that already. Public relations. Um, we're going to see more. Um, it's very cash. Uh, we will see more paid, what Pei Kong said, lifestyle media. We'll read about wine in, not in wine titles. In, us, in Russia, you already know that. Events. We're going to see more and more events, what we call experiential, experiential translators. I hope you can do that. Uh, marketing, where you're actually experiencing something. Tourism, wine tourism. Very important. Wine tourism does not exist in the way that golf tourism exists. People go to play golf every day for five days. People do not go to visit wineries every day for five days, or very few. So the wine producers are going to have to be much better at tourism in other ways. They will have to give us art, music, other things. Um, but for example, you will go and play golf in the morning and visit wineries in the afternoon. And there will be, you'll go to learn if you want to. We will see more video bloggers, we will see more Instagram, more images, and analytics. We will be much better at analyzing how the messages are going through. Anybody in this room who is a journalist, the people who are going to benefit from your writing are watching to see how many people are reading it, talking about it, doing things from it. So it's going to be much more scientific, the way that wine is promoted. Um, after this talk, uh, Anatoly will be saying, okay, there were 300 people. For, how many people listened to Robert Joseph? How many people went online and said they were interested or not interested or whatever? And if none of you do that, Anatoly will say, we wasted our time having Robert Joseph. If you all say Robert Joseph was very interesting, Anatoly will say, oh, Robert, come back. But that's essentially where we're going, and it is possible to do that today much more possible than in the past. Sommeliers, you are going to be more and more important. You're already very important, but you will be important outside your restaurants. You will be important at other events, and you will be the people who will be doing a lot of education. But please, those of you who are sommeliers in the room, be careful. Because if you are totally focused on the terroir, on the natural, on the mineral, and you ignore the fact that the oak wines are popular or the grababa wines are popular, you're in danger of being in a box. So uh, be aware. You do not have to talk about the wines that you're not interested in, but don't dismiss them. Be aware they exist. Be aware there is a market for them. So events. Distribution. <laughs> so... The on trade, going go back. The ranges in many restaurants and many shops are shrinking. People are buying from fewer suppliers, which is good if you're simple and you can supply all your wine to one company. But people are buying more online, there's more targeting. And in the on trade, we are going to have a broader range of places that sell wine. We have wine bars, we have, we will have a place that is a microbrewery and a distillery and a wine, an urban winery, all in the same. We're going to see wine shop cafes, more of those, which you already have some of. We're going to see more wine, uh, wine uh, uh, cafes, restaurants that belong to producers. 
Torres, Antonori are the pioneers. We will see more. And pop-ups. Pop-ups will come. There will be more and more where the shop or the restaurant or the cafe exists for one month and then goes away. Or it could even be a truck. Or, and I'm seeing a lot of that happening. Um, supermarkets are, the, I think, going to be in big danger. We have only had supermarkets since after the Second World War. If you went into a shop in 1939 and, or 1938 and picked a bottle from a shelf, that was called stealing. <laughs> so since 1950, we think it's more normal. But in the future, who's to say that we are going to have the big supermarkets? Already they're getting smaller. And the smaller supermarkets have smaller ranges. So that's all right. And the supermarkets are already becoming more and more focused online. In the UK, our biggest online wine retailer is Tesco, our biggest supermarket. So that is a trend. Um, but also, Amazon already owns Whole Foods in America. And is, Amazon might buy one of the British supermarkets. It might buy a supermarket in France. Amazon knows everything about us. So it's, they are there playing the game where people who want to buy in a shop can buy in the shop. People who want to buy online, buy online, and they will play with us. Specialist retail, those of you uh, doing, uh, who are carvists, yes, but you're talking about a very small number of the people who want to come to your stores. I think that your stores will become more interesting and not just be shops full of bottles. More events, more experiences, and not always just wine experiences. Maybe you will have a novelist coming to talk about his book. Maybe you'll have a musician coming to, to do some music. Yes, you will do education. In China, we're already seeing virtual reality. I might have a slide here um, where you can visit the vineyard like you saw in my earlier um, clip. And I think we're going to see wine, uh, wine shops combined with other things. So in China, this is virtual reality is coming. And this is real estate um, if I want to, or sorry, travel. If I want to decide where I'm going to travel, I can visit the hotel. I can walk around the beach. And this is Australian winery already has a virtual reality tour. We're looking at doing that for Le Grand Noir. Luxury, very quickly, we're going to talk about working with other luxury companies and targeting people with the money. And in restaurants, there is the list already for your special customers um, that they see the things that the ordinary customers don't see. So we're talking about ultra-wealth. In Russia, you're very aware of that. They're spending a lot of money on wine. But the point about the ultra-wealthy is they like experiences. So anything we can do with them, and we're seeing this in France and California, they make their own wine, they blend their own wine, they do their own things, that is an experience to them. Informal, this is something I think we're going to see more of, consumers actually working as ambassadors and salespeople for wine companies on commission. So you saw this with other products in uh, skincare and Tupperware, we are seeing this in wine. And I have a project I'm working on in the UK, um, but also I'll show you in a second, one of the wine companies is doing this. We see direct to consumer, huge growth in America, um, where that is the biggest growth area and high average price, um, going back, sorry, where, um, so direct to consumer, wine stores, so why buy from a shop when I can buy from the winery? Here's a chateau which sells directly online. Donald Trump, uh, or Eric Trump, his son sells through Amazon, but it's a direct sale. Every day, we celebrate and share our fascination for fine wine. From farming and winemaking, to the people, the passion, and the stories that make it an essential pairing to the best moments of our life. This genuine passion for wine and the lifestyle was why we decided to really create Wine Living at Home. Right, so that lady you just saw there 
is a consumer who is selling Boisset wine on commission for Boisset. And in my book on the future of wine, Jean-Charles Boisset appears quite often. Um, he is a genius, um, absolute genius, and he is, um, he, every, every day he's coming up with ideas, and we're going to see more and more of that. Wine clubs, people getting wine on subscription. Interesting, we're going to see vending machines. We can buy wine from a machine. Oh, but I'm too young. No, the machine can see my face, and the machine knows who I am. Amazon, Google, Facebook are going to be the biggest challenges. And um, Amazon will hold stock and sell from its warehouse, but Amazon will also sell directly from the winery. We have Amazon Marketplace, which is like that. Amazon will have its own wine label. And then we will have Google, Facebook, and in China, WeChat, and so on, will also be in the business of selling you wine. If you remember the earliest slide, one of the earliest clips, video clips, the phone was saying, do you want me to book your restaurant? Well, the phone could say, do you want me to buy the wine? <coughs> Alexa, testing one, two, three. Receiving, over. Alexa, what's the agenda? Here is the next event. It is in progress. 49 more Alexa commands. Lasts all day. Alexa, how tall are you? I'm about 10 inches tall. Alexa, how many centimeters are in 10 inches? 10 inches is 25.4 centimeters. Alexa, volume. So it may be difficult for you to understand, but it's worth watching. Alexa not only can already answer a wide range of questions, Alexa is learning. Alexa is learning from you. And remember, the next, the new generation of Alexa has a camera. Alexa can see whether you are smiling or not smiling when you are drinking the wine that she recommended. And she will know that. And if you're not thinking about that fully, you're going to miss a big point. So my book is coming out in, uh, as I said, February. So please keep in touch. Follow me on Facebook or on LinkedIn. Um, and now, please ask me some questions. There is a microphone, I think. I'd like to hear lots of questions and lots of argument. Thank you. Question. Can we have a microphone, please? Здравствуйте, Роберт. Скажите. Зачем в будущем нужна будет работа кависта с Эмилье, если есть такая возможность купить вино за 36 секунд с помощью гаджета? Или Алекса э, все расскажет, все подскажет. В чем смысл тогда профессии с Эмилье? В чем не боитесь ли, что индустрия роботехники, робототехники вот, э, заменит э, такие профессии? Yes. Um, am I concerned? Yes. And can I say that in Japan, um, already, Amazon has live Japanese sommeliers, I say sommeliers, um, who can answer the phone and answer your questions about wine. And you can say, I, I'm eating uh, lamb with chili tonight, which wine should I have? And Amazon's Japanese sommelier, uh, human being, will answer the question. And there is no reason, I think, why in two, three, four, five years that won't be a computer, a robot, answering that question. So, it's frightening. However, you are all human beings. Most of your customers are human beings. Human beings like dealing with human beings. So, I think that all of our strengths in this room, my strength here, if you like, is that I'm a human being. Maybe in five years' time, Anatoly will have a robot here giving a presentation. Maybe in five years' time, you will all be robots watching the robot. I don't think so. I think there is, there will always be a role for human beings with emotions, with intelligence, with intellect, talking to other human beings. But you will need to use all of your human qualities. If you as a human being are no better than a robot, 
we will replace you with a robot. Does that answer your question? Thank you for a great presentation. It Thank was you. Uh, very interesting. Um, to, uh, you have been talking about cost and the use of British wines and use of concentrate. Could you please explain uh, more in detail what, uh, what is concentrate and how it is made? It's very simple. Um, you just take the same as you have for orange juice. You can have two kinds of orange juice. One orange juice is made from freshly um, crushed uh, oranges. The other is we take the orange juice, we heat it up, we reduce the volume, we make a jelly effectively, and then we can add water later for the orange juice. Um, we reconstitute it. With wine, we make grape jelly. So we have, I don't know, a million liters of wine makes so many kilos of jelly. Um, and the jelly, or, or thick, uh, we just bring that to another country. It's, it's, it has some sulfur. Nothing's going to happen to it. It's already sweet. Uh, we add water. We add yeast. It is not legally wine. Very important. And it doesn't taste as good as wine. But if you play with it, we can make a wine-based product. And we can keep the price low. Not we. I don't want to do it, but it can be done. Um, and it's relevant in the UK because when the UK leaves the EU, all sorts of probably bad things will happen in the UK and we won't have as much money and it may be something we're going to see more of. Uh, you're saying that uh, viticulture will move uphill uh, in the future because of climate change, etc. But there is no uphill in Burgundy. There are no hills in Bordeaux. There is no uphills in Barolo, Barbaresco, and all these terra and whatever. So, do you think that there will be no border in the future? We'll all drink Languedoc, Australia, where I, you can move uphill. I very deliberately didn't go into those because I thought Neil Martin will be talking about fine wine later on. But I think that over time, the challenges for the traditional fine wine region, we, we don't know what is going to happen to the climate. We, if we have Donald Trump and another Donald Trump, um, and they are today, today they are changing the rules to make it easier for coal and to take away some of Obama's clean uh, air acts. If we heat up the climate by another two degrees, we will not have Bordeaux or Burgundy as we know it. It's, it's, just, it's logical, you've said it. You've got the hill of Corton, has got the trees at the top. I used to live in the Haute Côte, which is a little higher, but you don't make great wine in the Haute Côte. So the, the, the big question, one of my friends is Miguel Torres in Spain. And he is very concerned about this because um, the answer will be perhaps um, that we'll see more wine from um, uh, from the high vineyards in South America, for example. We're going to see wine from different places. Uh, we're seeing wine from England already, for example, from Denmark. But I love Burgundy. I'm passionate about Burgundy. I'm passionate about the, the great Mosel cabinets from, uh, from Germany. Um, but unless we all do everything we can to prevent the, 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 the continuing change of climate and to take the people who don't believe in it and put them on an island somewhere, um, maybe Antarctica. Um, I don't personally believe that my, I have a, a daughter who is 11 uh, and a son who is 12. I do not know that when those children are my age that they will be drinking the kind of Burgundy and Bordeaux that I am drinking. I don't think they will. And even if we stop things now, I think it will be difficult. So, um, to be honest, the facts are, and I, could, I have done a whole hour presentation on, on climate change, and you can read a lot um, online. But it's even more complicated because we don't even know what the climate will do. If we screw up um, the climate, really, we may find that some places get colder. So, it's, it's, nothing is clear. But we can't just say, we've always had Burgundy, we'll always have Burgundy. I don't think we will. Sorry. 
And I'm an optimist in life, but um, unless we do everything we can, I think we're at a very dangerous time. I'm not alone in that. I don't want, can I have somebody give me a question that makes for a cheerful answer? <laughs> I need to say something optimistic. Okay, I'm going to say something optimistic, and somebody doesn't have a question. There's a, there's a question at the back, and I'll come back to my optimism. Скажите, есть ли будущее у вин Армении и Грузии в Европе? Uh, I have to declare an interest because I'm doing some work for Georgia at the moment and indeed for Moldova, not for Armenia. Yes, um, but it's interesting because Georgia, the Kvevri wines have a very um, strong, small market which is uh, growing in, throughout the world. I would say very honestly, and if my Georgian friends uh, and clients were here, I would say this, Russia is actually part of Georgia's problem. Too much not very good Georgian wine is sold for too high a price in Russia. It is too easy to sell Rakatsateli in Georgian restaurants in Russia at high prices that those wines do not deserve. Some of those wines are no better than Trebbiano from Italy that would be a lot cheaper. But great Saparavi from Georgia is fascinating, is exciting, and I think there's a huge uh, future for it. Georgia has other grapes that I think are really interesting, including Kisi, for example, which I think we will see more of. So I'm not sure that the Georgian wines that we are seeing today are the future of Georgia. Georgia has 525 grapes, indigenous grapes and so on. Actually, it's growing five of them in any volume. It has huge potential to develop new ones. And Georgia has so many other strengths. It has tourism through its mountains, its uh, monasteries, it, Tbilisi, it has so much. And Kvevri will be the way to market uh, Georgian wine. But most Georgian wine is not Kvevri. We need to remember that. Armenia I know less about, but yes, there are some fascinating, I've been to, uh, I'm tasting some wines from Amas. There are some fascinating wines. I think you've given me the opportunity to finish on a positive note. The wine, the one thing about wine that we all hear about, and it's true, is it is about passion. Um, yes, there are industrial wines made by companies who don't care, but I was talking to Stephanie Gallo of the Gallo family last week. They make all sorts of wine I don't want to drink, but they're passionate people. They're passionate about good wine. They're, if you go to their individual vineyards, you will taste some brilliant wines. There are passionate people selling wine. And between them, though, those people are developing new places. I've been in Uruguay recently. Um, Moldova is another example. There are so many places where people are not economically, logically doing things. It, it doesn't necessarily make economic sense to make wine, sparkling wine in England today. I'm not sure all the Russian vineyards are necessarily all making one, m money from the first day they open. But there are passionate people making wine, passionate people selling it, passionate people in this room who are selling it in restaurants or in shops or as journalists writing about it. And if we do our jobs well enough, we get some passion out of the consumers. So yes, go back to Grababa. There are millions and millions of people who drink wine every day in the way they drink beer with no passion. Yeah. But even those people will have moments where they will be passionate about wine. And out of those people and out of everybody, there are people who discover the magic of wine, the magic of one vineyard, one producer, one vintage. And the moment they get that magic, like getting the passion for jazz music, which I love, or getting the passion for art, or the passion for shoes, those people are what are going to continue to drive the wine industry. So however many, however many robots there are, however much wine is made from concentrate, however industrialized it is, there will always be, I believe, a place for really great individual wine made by individuals for individuals. And I don't want you to leave this talk with me saying it's all going to be done by robots. And it's, I just want to give you a picture of the future. As I said, I have young children. I need to think about their future. You are all, most of you are younger than me, so you've got a future. 
Know what is out there. As I always say, if you're going to climb Mount Everest, it helps to know what the mountain is like, rather than saying, I climbed a small hill yesterday. Tomorrow I'm going to climb, climb Mount Everest, and I think it's going to be like the hill. Thank you very much. Thank you for your very professional and interesting forecast for new decades to come. Uh, the, yesterday we have been talking to Neil Martin, uh, and a friend of mine asked him a question. Since we are still talking about the future, this question probably could be very pending and interesting also for our colleagues. Um, so even though the new modern times, uh, that of um, a shortage in, uh, in availability of uh, fine wines, I mean, the rich people are getting, I mean, th there is an expansion of, uh, of the um, world fortune, let me say. And even though the wines are quite expensive, even sometimes not affordable, we predict a shortage of, um, of very, very rare and fine wines. How many years do we have, do you think? That's a very complicated question because I don't know, and this gentleman here asked the question earlier about Bordeaux and Burgundy. What is our definition of a rare and fine wine? Pingus. Let me say Burgundy. Burgundy and okay. Grand Cru Classe. Well, I think, sorry. If we take the, the very traditional areas, it's, it's happening every day. I used to drink Burgundy. I can't drink Burgundy very often. My friends who make Burgundy don't drink Burgundy as often as they did. So every year, there are more millionaires, more billionaires, uh, it's, it's, and the, the area is finite. Pomerol is very small. Um, Saint-Emilion Grand Cru Classe, very small. Poyac, very small. Uh, and obviously, Von Romanet. All of those, I think we just have to accept that it is a finite resource, and we accept it with gold, we accept it with other things. However, when I'm in China, the Chinese, and the thing that I'm very, very aware of in China is that China is evolving in the way that Japan evolved, but at 10 times the speed. So I go there three times a year, and every time I go, it's changing, changing, changing. The Chinese billionaire who last year bought Lafitte because Lafitte was the famous name, now is saying to me, I want to know more about Barolo or Brunello, he, usually a man, if Barolo, if all his friends start to drink Barolo, he will be looking at the finest wine from Argentina, the finest wine from somewhere else. So I think that the parallel, if you like, is with fashion. When I was young, Paris was fashion. Maybe with Italy. It wasn't Japan. We didn't have Isimiyaki. We did not have Kenzo. Um, Today, we're not, drink, we're not wearing Chinese fashion. Chinese are wearing Chinese fashion, we're not. The world is getting flatter. There will be more great wines. And I was pointing out Pingus. You said, well, Pingus isn't Burgundy. Pingus is already more expensive than many Burgundies. And we will see more and more places. The good thing, I love France. I am making wine in France. God did not make the French first and make everybody else with what was left over. By the way, God did not make the Americans first, or the Russians, or the British. Basically, we are living in a flat world. The French now have to compete with the Spanish, the Italians, and everybody. And I think that in 20 years' time, or 30 years' time, we will see what we already see, which is that um, the Maremma in Italy already competes pretty level with Bordeaux. It did not. Go back to the 1960s, 70s, it did not. In the future, Burgundy will be one of the places. Like Mozart maybe is the finest composer. Oh no, is that Bach? Or, but what about Debussy? And what, so I, I think we live with it. It's a long answer. But um, I think it's, it's where we are. But still very promising. Thank you. I'm, I am passionate about the, the fact that tomorrow somebody is going to give me, or this afternoon, somebody is going to give me a wine that is going to, say, that's going to make me say, wow, 
Three days ago in London, somebody gave me a Spanish wine called Il Prohibida, I think. It means the prohibited, the, the outlaw. Do you know it? It's made from Labrusca grapes. Labrusca grapes, not Labrusca, Labrusca grapes. It should be, you can't make good wine. And no, it's not Burgundy, it's not Bordeaux. It's not a great wine. It was delicious. So tomorrow, every day, every one of us will discover new wines. And please, my only, I don't need to say this to you because you're here, but just we need to keep our brains and our minds open. And if somebody says, here's a wine from Ethiopia, you don't go, oh. you go, yeah, okay. What can they do in Ethiopia? Because you will be surprised. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.